Romans chapter number 12, and then we'll spend a good bit of time in Proverbs this evening. Romans chapter 12, verse number 11. I don't know if you've been to the zoo and seen a sloth and wondered when it's going to move. Romans 12, 11, not slothful in business, by contrast, fervent in spirit, what should we do with that fervor? Serving the Lord, serving the Lord. Over to Proverbs, over to Proverbs chapter 12, Proverbs chapter 12, not slothful in business. Proverbs 12, why? Well, because other people are in business, they're competing with you. The Bible says in Proverbs 12, 24, the hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. You want to lose your liberty, your freedom, be lazy. You want to lose your business, lose your family, be lazy. You want to see your church fall apart, be lazy. The sloth, the sloth will be ruled over by the diligent. Proverbs 12, 27. The slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting, but the substance of a diligent man is precious. A sloth starts a job but doesn't finish it. Now you go out to hunt and you, you take that animal down, that doesn't feed you. You got to dress that thing, which is a fancy word for undressing it, and 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 then then you got to cook that thing, and now you got some food. That guy he, he picks up his bow and arrow and he he takes down a deer. He says, "That's it. I'm done for the day." Why? Why don't why don't he have a meal? Well, he's slothful. He can't finish a job he started. A lot of people start something for God, start something for the family, start something in a business, and they they don't see it through. Proverbs 15, verse number 19. The way of the slothful man is as a hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. A hedge of thorns, what's, well, the, the sloth complicates, it adds complications to life. Life's hard enough if you're diligent. Life's hard enough if you're fervent. You're lazy, it's going, to get, it's going to be even harder. And then full of thorns, you're going to hurt yourself. You think you're avoiding this and avoiding that, but it'll hurt you. It'll hurt you to be slothful. It'll hurt you to be lazy. Proverbs 18. Proverbs chapter 18. And verse number 9. He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. If you had a hundred bucks and set it on fire, people say you're crazy. But if you had a day to earn a hundred bucks and you wasted it watching TV, you're just as crazy. The slothful man wastes the life God gave him and wastes the opportunities God gave her. Sloths live in the tropical forests of Central and South America. With their long arms and shaggy fur, they resemble monkeys but they're related to armadillos and anteaters. They can grow two to two and a half feet long, they're not very big, and weigh from eight to 17 pounds. Small things, small things. There are two main species of sloth, they're identified by whether they have two or three claws. The two-toed sloth uh, holds the controller this way. <laughs> the three-toed sloth holds it like this. The two species are quite similar in appearance with roundish heads, sad looking eyes, tiny ears, and stubby tails. Two-toed sloths are slightly bigger and tend to spend more time hanging upside down than their three-toed cousins who will often sit upright in the fork of a tree or a branch. So some are like this when they watch the tube and others are like this when they watch the tube. It's just, it's just a different, different body posture, chair or sofa, depending on, on the, the, uh, the species of the sloth. The uh, 
Three-toed sloths have facial coloring that makes them look like they're always smiling. They also have two extra neck vertebrae to allow them to turn their heads almost all the way around. So they don't have to exert the energy of doing this when they, <laughs> when they want to look to the right or the left, they can just turn their head. And you think I'm kidding, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, some scientists believe that's what fake science is. It's a religion. It's a religion. Evolutionists believe. You know why? It's a religion. It's not science. If it's a belief, <laughs> you, you didn't, you say, well, you, you believe in God. I do. I do. I've, I've not seen God. I believe in God. It's faith. By faith. I'm saved by grace through faith. But you're wanting me to abandon my faith and you mock it saying you have science. And I'll read your science book and it says over and over again, scientists think, scientists believe. So I'm not going to abandon my faith for your faith. Because your faith is always changing when, every time we prove it wrong. Anyway, some scientists believe that sloths develop their slow motion lifestyle so they would be less noticeable to predators such as hawks and cats, which rely heavily on their eyesight when hunting. Okay, let me help you out, boys and girls, in case you're, you're going to a school that wants you dumb. Yeah. Yeah. If cats see you and eat you, because you can't get away from them. You don't have 400 million years to come up with another plan. <laughs> Let me figure out how to move slow and then they won't see me. By the time you figure it out, you're lunch. See, when evolution teaches these adaptations were developed over time to enable this species to survive, it couldn't have survived the time it took to develop what you say it has to have to survive. That's why the thing is a joke. The algae that grows on sloth's fur, it's what happens after six days without a shower because you're just about to find the magic sword. Son, what's that smell? Nothing, Mom. I think it's you. Leave me alone, Mom. I'm about to kill the leprechaun. <laughs> the algae that grows on sloth's fur also helps them avoid predators by letting them blend in with green leaves. They rarely come down from the trees. About, about once every week, they descend to go to the bathroom. They peel themselves out of their gamer chair. <laughs> they race to the restroom. Well, not race exactly. And get back to the console quickly before somebody else unlocks the secret chamber with the machine gun in it. <laughs> As they descend from the trees for their weekly trip to the bathroom... They slowly move about by digging their front claws into the dirt and dragging their bodies. But if they're caught by a predator, sloths turn from sluggish to slugger, biting fiercely, hissing, slashing with their claws, and shrieking, Dad, leave me alone! <laughs> you don't understand, Dad! I could be a pro! <laughs> From the moment they're born, sloths are able to lift their, now this is impressive, lift their entire body weight upwards with just one arm. That's pretty cool. Not only that, but sloths have 30% less muscle mass than similar sized mammals and are over three times stronger than the average human. I still think I could whip one, but that's, that's you know, by size and, and all that. At least I could run away from it. They have a highly specialized muscle arrangement that can produce enough strength to withstand the force of a jaguar trying to rip them from the tree. So they're hanging on the tree. The jaguar finds them. In 300 million years, they'll move even slower, and then the jaguar won't be able to find them. But, but the jaguar finds them. But, but he can't rip it out of the tree because of the way their muscles are formed. 
I said, man, I'd like to see something like that. Well, you can't. <laughs> no, I'm not going to mow the yard. No, no, I'm not going to mow the yard. No, stop. <laughs> and dad, with all his strength, can't, can't pull the kid out of the couch and get him to the lawnmower. Specialized tendons in the sloth's hands and feet lock into place. <laughs> allowing them to hang upside down for long periods of time without wasting any energy. <laughs> Ain't nothing else moving. Look at that. It's a highly specialized form of human. <laughs> Son, are you paralyzed? Don't matter. <laughs> That's all I need right here. Bring me a hot dog. <laughs> this unique locking mechanism is also how sloths are able to sleep while <laughs> hanging from a tree branch. They've even been known to remain suspended upside down after death. They hadn't moved in so long, nobody knows if they're dead or alive. They have a very rare condition called rod monochromacy, I'm sure I pronounced that wrong, which means that they, are, they completely lack cone cells in their eyes. As a result, they're colorblind, can only see poorly in dim light, and are completely blind in bright daylight. But if you never leave the basement, it doesn't matter. You just, you just stay down there in a dark room and sit real close to the screen, and it's, it's almost like you're there. Wherever there is, there's not really any there there. Thankfully, sloths compensate for such poor vision by having a phenomenal sense of smell and great spatial memory. Their bad eyesight also plays a key role in the sloth's slowness. You can't run around in the trees if you can't see where you're going. So. Unlike most mammals, here we go. Let, listen, this, this, is, this is this geographic stuff, you know. National Geo, well, that's a National Geographic, yeah, or, or Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. How many of y'all remember that? Uh, Jim, go in there and wrestle that crocodile for me. <laughs> There's a rattlesnake. Jim, go get the rattlesnake. <laughs> that was Jim, man. I'd have quit that show a hundred times. Oh, my. <laughs> Marlon standing there talking to the camera while Jim risked his life. Anyway. I may remember that. Yeah, okay, all right. I'm just making sure. Unlike most mammals, sloths have sacrificed the ability to control their body temperature in order to save energy. <laughs> Which sloth exactly got them together and said, let's do this? And having decided, you know, the head, the head sloth, having decided that all the other sloths should sacrifice their ability to control their body temperature, how exactly did they manage to do that? Yeah. You know, people make fun of you for believing in God. I make fun of you for saying stuff like that. <laughs> That's dumb. First of all, the sloth didn't decide anything. The sloth didn't sacrifice anything. And if... So it's just amazing. Instead, they're completely reliant on the environmental conditions and their core temperature can fluctuate over 10 degrees Celsius during the course of a single day. If they get too cold, the special microbes that live in their stomach can die and the sloth can no longer digest the leaves that it eats. Well, that's, that's interesting, but that's serious. Most of the time you've got a dog or a cat and you say, oh, it's so cold outside, how come the dog don't care? Because he, he, he just... Regulates. Cat don't care. Cat will stand out there in the field. My, my wife, every time she sees a cow in the snow, oh, the poor cow! <laughs> cow don't care, man. He, I mean, he's, he's bummed out because there's no grass, but, but the temperature, he can handle that. But the sloth, that temperature drops 30 degrees. Inside, he's dropping 30 degrees. And it gets, gets real hot, he's getting real hot. And I mean, you got to feel bad for those kids. Thermostats set too high and they're down there sweating. But they've sacrificed their ability to 
get up and go change the thermostat. Because it's a long way off. <laughs> so, now this is pretty cool. Sloths are anatomically designed to be protected should they fall out of a tree. On average, a sloth will fall out of a tree uh, once a week for its entire life. <laughs> when it does, it decides this is a good time to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Kill, kill two birds with one stone here. <laughs> Didn't even have to climb down. <laughs> <It's not> <laughs> so, I bet nobody else is preaching this anywhere in the world tonight. All sloths are anatomically designed to fall and survive. They can plummet from over 100 feet without injury. That's pretty cool. I feel sorry for the sloth that was used to find out a hundred's the limit. <laughs> this National Geographic guy is like, okay, try, we're going to try 60 feet. <laughs> okay, 70. <laughs> 105. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Dead sloth. <laughs> then the next week the sloths got together and said, let's, let's adapt so we can fall 105 feet. <laughs> then I said, I don't know, it's going to take like 250 million years. I don't know if we got time for that. <laughs> sloths have an unusual method of camouflage. This will creep you out. Who said yay? <laughs> Cracks in their hair allow many different species of algae and fungi to grow, which eventually makes the sloth appear green. I want to hold one. No, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> sloth hair also provides home to an entire ecosystem of invertebrates. Some species are found living on sloths that exist nowhere else on earth. No word on if they get smashed when the sloth falls out of the tree. <laughs> There's a thing called a sloth moth. Doesn't that sound nice? Sloth moth. Makes you want to wear a mask even if you don't like masks. <laughs> A single sloth can host up to 950 moths and beetles within its fur at once. Remember, the thing is two feet long. It's got 950 moths living in its hair. How long has that thing been sitting there? Whew. The impressive biology of a sloth allows it to spend 90% of its life hanging upside down. Studies show that this is made possible because their organs are attached to their rib cage, which means they don't weigh down on the lungs. That's pretty cool. This means that unlike us, a sloth can hang upside down with no effect on its breathing. Sloth's nature allows it to conserve energy. This is great. Moving slower than any other mammal on the planet. This modest pace means sloths generally travel no more than 125 feet in a single day, which is about three trips to the refrigerator. It's about just <laughs> back, back, back and forth. On a rare occasion, they find themselves at ground level. They crawl only about one foot per minute. Now listen. If you're not doing your best for God, he calls you a sloth. A moss-infected, algae-covered, sluggish creature that basically does nothing its entire life. All it does is hang around and hope it doesn't fall or get eaten. That's a stinky life. 
I'm saved by grace. You know, once you're in Christ, you can't fall out of Christ. That's it. <laughs> Your life's ambition is something you don't even do. <laughs> it's something God does for you. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, I might cover 125 feet on a good day. <laughs> Sloth. He calls us slothful. Don't be slothful in your business. You'll go out of business. Don't be slothful in your family life. You'll lose your family. You go into a slothful church. It's a church doing nothing for God and helping you be comfortable doing nothing for God. I don't want to waste my life hanging upside down. Look in Proverbs, <laughs> Proverbs 19. Proverbs chapter 19 a slothful man hideth his hand in his bosom and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. What, he's too lazy to feed himself. Like several million adult males in the United States of America and several million adult females in the United States of America who sit around and wait for you working people to feed them. You know what the Lord said? I don't want you to be a sloth. You know, it's, it's not a very far trip from here to here. Too far for the sloth. Too much work to feed himself. Look at Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22. Son, get out there and do those chores. Daughter, get in that, get in that kitchen. Get that work done. Man, aren't you going to get a job this week? Well, watch. There's a reason. There's a reason. Verse 13, Proverbs 22, 13. The slothful man saith, there's a lion without. I should be slain in the streets. The odds of that are what? <laughs> hey, kid, did you rake those leaves yet? Dad, Dad, there could be a, there could be a lion out there. You know, two weeks ago, a bear turned over a garbage can about six miles from here. <laughs> could happen, could happen. Honey, get in there, get those dishes done. Mom, did you know how many slip and fall accidents there are in kitchens every year? <laughs> if, if you told this slothful man to get to work and he said, I can't go out of the house, there might be a lion out there. You'd look for another employee. And if he wasn't unionized, you'd get rid of him. <laughs> you, you'd get rid of this guy if you, if you could, but you can't get rid of him. Now, you know what he said? The sloth, are you, God give you a job to do? God give his church a job to do? God give you a life to live for Jesus? The slothful man comes up with the craziest excuses for not doing what he's supposed to do. And maybe they sound okay to him, but they don't sound okay to the one that, put it, that sent him out to do the job. Is there a lion in the streets? Go shoot it. <laughs> take your rifle with you. Well, I don't want to kill the lion. Okay, take a whip with you. Take a slower friend with you. <laughs> there, there's... there's there's, there's, there's ways around it. Look, the diligent man, if there is a lion, figures out a way to deal with the lion. The slothful man doesn't do anything in case there is a lion. Yeah. You know what God wants you to be? The diligent man, not the slothful man. The diligent Christian, not the slothful Christian. Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24. This is true of material property, this is true of friendships, relationships, your house, your church. Watch it. Proverbs 24, verse 30. I went by the field of the slothful, and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. 
Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth. And thy want as an armed man. Have you ever had a weed in your yard? Anybody ever have a weed? Come on, you've had a weed in your yard. You think that weed could knock down the walls of your house? You know what the Bible says? You leave one weed, you'll have two weeds. You leave two weeds, you'll have four weeds. You leave eight weeds, you'll have a dozen weeds. If you leave them long enough, the weeds will turn into plants, and the plants will turn into trees. They'll undermine the foundation, they'll crack the walls, then they'll grow up over the walls, they'll force part of the wall this way and part of the wall that way. And you go by a place, you say, 60 years ago there was a house here, the one right across the street, big nice house inside a beautiful landscape piece of property, and now it's all torn down. Who tore it down? A lazy man. Who tore it down? A slothful man. You say, what happened? The trees just took it over. The plants just took it over. You think your dad's mean? Your dad's mean because he's not going to let that weed stay put in your life. He's going to root it out before it's two weeds and six weeds and ten weeds and twenty weeds. He's going to say, no, it's not, that's not going to grow here. It's just a little weed, Dad. It's just a little, <laughs> little weed. <laughs> it's just... That's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> How's that for an unintended illustration? <laughs> Your dad said, listen, Hunter, if I don't deal with this now, <laughs> for long I'll owe China the United States of America. I mean, look, look how... <laughs> the reason you've got to be diligent is because what you think won't hurt might not hurt today. But if it takes root and grows and drops seed and multiplies, before long it's going to tear your house down. Get up, get out of bed, do your best, eliminate the junk from your life that's wasting your life and be diligent about your family and your career and your studies and your God. You're building a life. And you can build a strong life that will stand the test of time. Or you can sleep through the, the main, maintenance years. You say, you know, well, I, I met a good man. We got married. I met a good girl. We got married. We had a happy marriage. We lived three years, four years, five years happy together. Yeah, but during that three, four, five years, were you maintaining the things that made you a good man and her a good girl? Or did, you, did your marriage turn into a weed patch? And before long, the walls are broke. And somebody comes by and says, man, what happened to that marriage? Well, they just got lazy. They just got indifference. What happened to that church? They great, used to be great churches all over America. What happened to them? Preacher got tired of weeding out heretics. Preacher got tired of losing two, three families every time he had to tell a, a, a liberal mother that her daughter wasn't going to dress like that at church. And they just got fed up with it and just let the weeds grow. And now those churches are gone, completely gone, and nobody can figure out what happened to those churches. You've got to maintain that thing. I'm telling you something. I don't, I don't know what God has for his life. I don't know what God has for my life. But if God lets me live and preach a few more years, and we, we turn this thing over uh, to Brother David, um, if he keeps doing what we're doing, you'll have a great church for another 30, 40 years. But if he decides, we're not pulling weeds anymore. We're not dealing with thorns and thistles anymore. It's too much work. It's too much trouble. This thing will go to, it, this thing will go to ruin faster than you can believe. It's a fact. It's a fact. All right. Let's look at something else here. There's plenty of these in here. Proverbs, uh, oh, back to 21. Proverbs 21. That last one we read said that man's void of understanding. His house fell down. He couldn't figure out how it fell down. Because Bill Nye, the science guy, told him it would evolve into a bigger house and a nicer house. And <laughs> Bill Nye, the reprobate guy. Proverbs 21, verse 25. The desire of the slothful 
killeth him. Oh, I wish I had a car like that. Oh, I wish I had clothes like that. Oh, I wish I had money like that. Oh, I wish I had a house like that. Well, how does it kill him? For his hands refuse to labor. People want things they can't afford, but they don't want to work for them. So somebody comes along and says, well, I'll tell you what I'll, tell you what I'll do. We've got a piece of plastic here. Get this piece of plastic here, and you can, you can use this piece of plastic. So I, said, I was telling somebody before church, went to the dentist a while back, and the dentist said, you need some work done. I said, how much is it? And he said, it's like three, $4,000. When do you want to schedule it? I said, I'll get back to you. He said, well, you know, we, we, we need to schedule that today. I said, I don't have, have $4,000 to give you, $3,000 to give you for dental work. He said, well, you can make payments. I said, will it reduce the total? <laughs> no, then I don't, I don't have it. If you don't have it in one month, you don't have it bits. And he said, well, you can put it on a credit card. Okay, so let me see. I don't have three grand, but I will have three grand plus 9%. Listen, here's, here's the danger about the slothful person. People live in their daddy's house. Their daddy's work 40 years or more. And they want to get married and have a house like their daddy had. You can get yourself in trouble. Why don't you work first and then get that big house? Why don't you do what we did and drive junky cars and crummy cars and Cars, you got to pump the brakes and hope that you can pump them just right and get them to work. We had a pickup truck, and when, when we hit a pothole or a bump in the road, the headlights would go out. <laughs> and you'd have to look for another big jolt in the road to try and make them come back on. It's crazy. You say, man, that, car, that truck was dangerous. No, drunk drivers couldn't see us. So they, they, <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> work hard until you can afford what you want. And if you worked hard and can't afford what you want, work harder. If you work harder and you can't afford what you want, work longer. Or just go hang out in a tree somewhere <laughs> like a sloth. And wish you had what other people had. Proverbs 26. Proverbs 26. What do we title this message? The giant sloth. Let's call it "Feel the Burn." It's a Bernie, it's a Bernie Sanders campaign message here. Huh. Verse fourteen, Proverbs twenty. No, just lay around all day, do nothing, and the government will come along and give you everything you want. That's not Bible. That goes against the Bible. Uh, verse 13, he says it again, slothful man saith there's a lion in the way, a lion is in the streets. As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. Now you see that door back there? Look, go t just take a quick look. See those two big double doors back there? I know you've seen them before, but it just helps me to know. You. Anyway, that for 25 years that door has gone here, and here, and here, and here, and that's as far as it's got in two and a half decades. And some of y'all got grown sons living in your house, and they go from here, to here, to here, to here. Next time it's his weekly trip to the bathroom, Throw away his mattress, change the locks on the doors, and stop facilitating that rotten behavior. The slothful, <laughs> look at this, the slothful hideth his hand in his bosom, it grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. What are you doing? I'm looking, I'm looking for my phone. Thought I'd put it in my pocket. Well, son, it's time to eat. You know, okay, but I'm looking, I'm looking for my phone. <laughs> son, we're about to start supper. I can't, I can't find my phone. Can you, can, you bring, can you bring it to me, Mom? Can you bring... 
Get out of bed and do something with your life. Come on. You got all this ability. You've got all this brains God gave. You got all these muscles God put in your body. You live in a country where you can start with nothing and achieve. Really, you, you can achieve incredible things. Go do something with your life. I'm going to tell you something. You, 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 you can like this or not like this. The, the, the Civil War took out about two out of every five men in the southern United States. And then Reconstruction came down and took what little money was left. They didn't rebuild the South. They came down and plundered what was left of the South. And then a generation later, there's an economic collapse, the 1880s. A generation later, there's a Great Depression. And my father was born at the, at the dawn of the Great Depression, and six months later, his father was killed in a railroad accident. And he grew up with one pair of overalls for a year, and one pair of shoes for a year, and living on what his widowed mother could scrape together off about an acre and a half of land. And retired the president of a bank that he built with his own hands. Don't talk to me about your poverty and where you were born and you got a bad start in life and you came from a single parent home. Work! Work! Work hard at your studies. Work hard at your job. Bank president. Only could be a bank president. He was a teller and went to school at night after work and put off getting married till he was 30 and could afford a wife. Okay? Wasn't the smartest man in the world. He didn't have the best opportunities in the world. But he sure wasn't lazy. And he didn't blame other people for the bad start that he got in life. He just worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. Submariner in the Second World War at age 16. It's hot. It's cold. The air can just, Mom, can, can, can you turn the air down in the car? It's hot back here in the back seat. Stop with all that. You're going to see hot, man. Electric bills get where they're headed. Can't drill for oil and can't pipe oil in. Sell what you got to foreign countries. You know those Cokes you drink are in plastic cups. That's, that's oil. That's oil. Everything you got is plastic. That's oil. I don't play on the computer. Oil. Turn the lights on. Oil. Oil. You can like oil, not, not like oil. If you think it's a good idea to get rid of oil, you're going to get rid of everything you're enjoying right now, except Jesus and the Bible, and some of you aren't enjoying that, so that, that don't count. Anyway, a few more verses here. You can take it. You can take it. I mean... Once in a while we can go like this. Proverbs 26, we read that one, 15? Yeah, that's the one we just read. All right, well, that's on the Old Testament. Okay, Matthew 25. Matthew 25. I hope there's not many of the New Testament as there were in the Old. Why, are you getting tired of turning pages? Are you getting tired of sitting there? <laughs> that church service is so long I had to sit for an hour. <laughs> oh, we got it rough, don't we? Two years ago, we were in the Philippines. We sat through a 13-hour church service on benches that were three strips of wood and curved. I didn't whine till near the end, like the second hour. <laughs> First hour, I was excited. Then these dogs started coming and laying on the floor. I was so jealous. I wanted to get off that bench and lay down on that floor, man. Like, I don't often envy dogs, but that one, dog is breaking my heart, man. Matthew 25, Matthew 25, verse, um, that's not right. Oh, I'm in 26. Matthew 25, here we go, verse uh, 24. 
Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. So the Lord gave him a talent, and he did nothing with it. 26. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. The Lord was angry with a man, not because he wasn't a servant, but because he didn't serve. Not because he didn't have talent and opportunity, but because he wouldn't use it for the Lord. And he's angry with him. He says he's wicked. I don't drink, I don't smoke. You don't do nothing. (laughs) It's not enough to have a list of things you don't do. How about what do you do? And the Lord is angry with this man and he calls him slothful. You're a three-toed, two-toed, moth-infested, sluggard. Hmm. Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 6, two more verses, two more verses. Look, if you're a working man, if you're a hard-working woman, you ought to appreciate this. I'm not preaching to you. I'm preaching at the people that are taking 40% of your paycheck. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm sorry, 6. It's, it's, it's verse 12. Hebrews 6 verse 12. Hurt myself falling out of that tree from 70 feet. All right, verse 10, Hebrews 6, 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. They go together. Love your family, work. Love your family, labor. You love God, you love God's church, work, labor. Which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints, and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You know why we have a church 2,000 years after Christ rose from the dead? Because for 2,000 years we've had hard-working people started churches, fought to keep churches true, labored to win souls. Yeah. Now you already said, you want this thing to keep going until the rapture? Don't be slothful. Yeah. Don't be slothful. Keep working, keep working hard. All right, finally, Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. Let's check in with the wisest man that ever lived with wisdom given to him by God. Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. By much slothfulness the building decayeth, And through idleness of the hands, the house droppeth through. I'm going to stand for the Lord one day. So are you. And I am certain the Lord will not be able to say you were the best at this and the best at that and the most accomplished over here and the most accomplished over there. But I tell you, there's one thing I can do. I can stand there and have God look at me and know I gave it everything I had. You can't do what anybody else can do, but you can do your best, and God expects you to do your best. And families die because people are lazy, and nations die because people are lazy. What's killing your country is lazy people that won't work for their own family and provide for their own needs. Everything else is is 
falls in line with that. But the, and, and churches, churches die. I, listen, I'm, I'll say this. I'm not, I don't want, I don't, I'm not going to fight with anybody. Everybody's got different opinions. I know that. You like your seat. You got your, your inner GPS working just right. And you like where you park and all that. But I'm telling you something. If we're happy with how many people are in our church and how many people are here on Sunday night and how... And, and you don't want to you don't want to build bigger and get more people in. I, I, look, I understand everybody's got their reasons. I'm just telling you something. If you don't keep working and keep working and keep working, what you have is going to start falling apart. You can't stay where you are. You stay fervent and diligent and energetic and hardworking, or things begin to decay and things begin to fall apart. Okay. You got a great marriage? I hope you got a great marriage. I do. I hope you got a great marriage. What'd you do to get to the point where you have a great marriage? You can't stop doing so. Okay, that's it. We got a great marriage. I ignore her. She ignores me. I don't buy her anything. She don't, she don't buy me. Just, that's it. We're here. We, we made it. You got to keep going, man. You got you to keep going. You got to keep working at that thing. Amen. Amen. So you get idle. You get slothful, no matter how nice a house it is, it falls down. Falls down. So let's stay at it. Let's be diligent. Let's be fervent. Let's don't be slothful. I was in high school. They got all excited. Woo! They were digging a, a shell pit off Nova Road. They're going to turn Nova Road from two lanes into four lanes. Anybody ever grew up over in Daytona Beach area? Nova Road was the truck route. You took Nova Road to bypass Daytona Beach. Now, man, it's right in the heart of, uh, right in the middle of, of everything on both sides. Anyway, so they're digging that, and they, they found these bones, and turns out it was the bones of a giant sloth. Woo! So they built a museum, Daytona Beach Museum of Arts and Sciences. You said, man, I can pay for something like that. Well, they make all the parents pay a dollar, and the kids go up on a bus, all the classes go up there, and see, woo, see the giant sloth. Woo, look at that. Big giant sloth. You know what it is? It's just a sloth bigger. <laughs> and when the sloth said, let's decide to regulate our body temperature, the giant sloth said, no, we, don't, we, we vote no. <laughs> and and so, so they all died off. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know what killed all the giant sloths. It might have been when the cavemen invented uh, muzzle-loading rifles, <laughs> for, all, for all I know. <laughs> But anyway, they found that giant sloth, and, and that was 19, I don't know, I was in junior high school. There was a, a science teacher from the high school went down there and, and helped them dig the bones up and everything. So that's probably 1971, 72, something like that. And they put that sloth in that museum, and it ain't done nothing since. <laughs> it's just standing right there. People go look at it. <laughs> giant sloth. And some of y'all, man, God came all the way down from heaven dug your soul out of a pit, washed you from your sins, cleaned you up, and put you in the body of Christ. <laughs> That's all you've done ever since. Just stand, stand right there. Say, Look at me. Look at me. I was dug from the pit. Look at me. God put me in this great building here. Look at me. Yeah, so, oh, you're doing taking up space when people come look at you. Good. Bunch of bones, man. Good. Come on, are you saved? You ought, you ought to sin, you're in Christ, you're part of the body of Christ. Then do something. Amen. Do something. Get busy. Get busy. Amen. I'll stop here in a second. I'll, uh, really, but honestly, you, um, if, if any of you own a, own a company, if any of you manage a business, you, you, you got to back me up here because you know I'm telling the truth. I'm, I'm talking to the rest of you now. A man invests everything he's got to start a business so he can make money. You want to you you have a good job? You want to have a better job? You want to move up and get paid more money? Then make him more money. Work as hard for that man as you can work. Make yourself indispensable. How do you do that? Hard work. Hard work. Be diligent. Be fervent. 
The people, we used to have these people in, in church, you know, well, you get these, these elite people that the pastor favors. We're here trying to win souls for Christ and build a church, and I got people helping me do that, and I got people like you con- criticizing them. Who you, th- who you think we're going to promote to Sunday school teacher and deacon and, and officers in the church? People that are working to build this thing. Not people show up when they got nothing else to do. Well, I wish I was a leader in the church. Don't wish it. Work. Work. Amen. Four-letter word. All right. Heavenly Father, help us shake off our complacency, our indifference, our sluggish attitude, a lot of things in our life, just, just idle time, wasted time. I, I, I'm, I'm sure of that, Father. Lord, what we could do for you if we were all diligent and fervent. Help us, please, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.